This is the time for sportsmen right now. If you enjoy hunting, boy, the next six weeks. And it's going to come and go so fast, Fred. You it, know how it is. Every fall it's this way. It already has. On Saturday, the season opens for ducks. They're flying right now. These little uh, northern winds that we've had the past few days are going to increase, push the ducks south. Uh, we have so many species to hunt for, rabbits, squirrels, pheasants, grouse, deer, all coming your way. Bob Garner and I, Fred Trost, are going to have a small game hunting forecast coming up, so you stay tuned. It's Thursday night, time for Michigan Outdoors. Here's a creature of the farms, the woodlands, uh, suburbs even. They have adapted very well to suburban landscapes. Uh, this is a fox squirrel. You see it throughout southern Michigan. This animal has received really no game management over the years. It doesn't need any. Its mortality is high. About 80% of the squirrels that are born every year die by the time the winter comes to an end because the winter is very harsh. That's why these squirrels bury nuts and bury their food so they can try to find it in the winter. But many of them freeze in the trees. Yeah, they have to have, a, have an inordinately large food cache because they even wind up losing part of their food cache to other critters throughout the winter. Whether squirrels are hunted or not, they have that 80% mortality. Hunters uh, work in on that and they take what the hawks and owls don't take or... Uh, and it's an, it's an enjoyable, per, enjoyable pursuit. Squirrel meat is excellent eating and you can also, especially youngsters, can be trained in how to sit quietly and, and uh, wait for their uh, weight uh, like they would deer hunting. Exactly. In the southern part of the state, you're going to find those fox squirrels in a lot of the, the farmlands. They like to get out in the cornfields. In the northern part of the state, in the UP, you find your, your tree squirrels, the gray squirrel, the black squirrel. They jump from tree to tree. The fox squirrel you oftentimes find on the ground. But that's a type of hunting that at this time of year, it's beautiful. You get out with a 22 rifle or a shotgun, sit in the woods, and wait. No, that's Quietly. Fun. Quietly. That's what the name of the game is <laughs> squirrel sure hunting. Is. A good training for deer hunting. Now, Duck hunting. We take a look at the pintails on the wall here, one of the many species of ducks we, we have in Michigan. These pintails are one of the ducks that opens up on Saturday. This is not a quiet way of hunting necessarily. You have to sit camouflaged, oftentimes with a dog to retrieve the ducks. You're up to your waist in water, but calling and using decoys uh, is oftentimes necessary in duck hunting. It's not only necessary, that's where all the fun is. Oh, I mean, to me, anyway. Well, I, and I, the I, dog work. There, oh, yeah. There are many aspects of duck hunting that make it totally enjoyable, setting out the decoys. And duck hunters, by the way, have a tremendous investment in decoys. I sure do. You do. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the hunters we know have 100, 200 decoys that they set out. The calls, their guns, steel shot. Boats, licenses. Boats, licenses uh, cost an arm and a leg. <laughs> and following the regulations, there's, uh, it's a highly regulated activity in the outdoors. Uh, we have uh, in our upper peninsula is where our ducks are going to be coming through First. from the prairie countries in Canada. Now, we have good local populations of ducks right good now. Good local populations in the lower and the upper. Right. But as these flight ducks come through, what are we going to experience this year, Bob? We're going to see probably one of the worst seasons in recent, uh, recent memory for flight ducks. So two or three weeks after the season opens, if you're hunting in the southern part of the state, when our resident ducks have moved out, you might be sitting along the shores of Saginaw Bay or Houghton Lake or the western part of the state, you are probably not going to find the birds that we had last year, and last year was not a real was great not year. A, it was not a banner year, and you're going to see, uh, and the limits, of course, have been reduced, too. Now, one bright spot that a bird that is on the upswing is our ruffed grouse. Ruffed grouse uh, are a native bird in Michigan. They inhabit the woodlands. You have to hunt them in the woodlands, unlike our fox squirrels, which you'll find in the farm country. Although more and more grouse have moved into southern Michigan, in the past few years, the same way deer have moved into southern Michigan. Well, the, the, yeah, when the forest when the forest got cut, when when big trees were mm -hmm. made into smaller trees, grouse could uh, essentially live there a lot easier. If you find habitat that looks like this while you're pheasant hunting or rabbit hunting, you are liable to put up a grouse in southern Michigan. Also, at this time of year, before the migrations move through, you will find woodcock, and woodcock are are small birds, oh, six eight ounces and have a long bill. They inhabit the marshlands. They like to eat worms. Uh, they're a very elusive target, very quick. Upper Peninsula, probably some of the best woodcock Iron hunting. Iron Dickinson County, a little bit Menominee, probably the best woodcock hunting in the world. The, from September 15th to, you know, today's what, August uh, 3rd? October. October 3rd, I mean. 
Today is October 3rd, and they may have moved out by now. Yeah, they move into the lower peninsula of our state as they fly down to the south where they spend their winter, and you're going to find them in the marshy areas. But by the 1st of November, they're going to be gone. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But uh, grouse hunting is a, is a type of hunting that you do in the thickets, the shin tangles, oftentimes using a dog. It's a lot of fun. And the, the outlook is so good. The grouse are on a five-year swing upward that I even went out and bought a pointing dog this year. I know it. I know you got an English setter. That's right. That's great. I'm going to enjoy that a lot. Bob. For the grouse, right? <laughs> That's right. Pheasant hunting, though. Let's take a look at what used to be the king of the game birds in the state. The ring-necked pheasant has lost that position, not just in Michigan, but throughout the country. The farmlands do not hold the pheasants that they did years ago. You've heard this song for the past 15 or 20 years, the decline of the pheasant, and it continues. And it's not a phenomenon just in Michigan either. Uh, I remember talking to the biologists in northern Indiana. Same problem. They can't figure out exactly what's happened to their pheasants either. Nobody knows. Possibly it's a genetic problem where the species that was introduced here back at the turn of the century has, is unable to cope for some reason. And, the, and that does lend us some hope. If it is uh, uh, genetics or whatever, it does lend us some hope that we can do something about it. What you're looking at right here is a little bit of, of a marsh that is a culvert, some wetland. For some reason, the pheasants that we have now gravitate towards those marshlands, the wetlands, and they're tougher to hunt. Oh, they're swamp birds. You know, like you always heard about the big swamp bucks. Well, I swear that's where those that's pheasants right. are hanging out. Now, the pheasants, southern Michigan is pheasant, the pheasant range. They're not in the northern part of the state. Uh, the southern part of the state is where they are. There used to be hot spots, Berrien County. Uh, the mid part of the state around Lansing even was a good one. The thumb, oh, back in the 50s, you couldn't beat it. But nowadays, would you dare point your finger at a hot spot, Bob, for pheasant? Uh, there isn't a spot that's even lukewarm. Uh, <laughs> last year was just, just horrible, and the brood counts were down 68% from last year. Give me central Michigan and a little bit in the thumb, and that's the best bet, but it isn't hot. Hunting, stopping hunting won't help the pheasant population. Oh, there is, a hot, there is a hot tip I can give you, yeah. though. State game and rec areas in That's southern right. Michigan, most of them will be planted with birds opening day. But the, if there is a, a bright spot for small game hunters in southern Michigan, it's rabbits. Cottontail rabbits uh, are up tremendously. They sure are. In many areas. Snowshoe hares, this is a, a rabbit, a, a hare, actually, of the northern part of the state and in the UP. It turns white in the winter and is all brown in the summer. And the snowshoe hares right now are in the process of turning. They're called snowshoe hares, not because hunters have to hunt them with snowshoes necessarily. No, but no. When the snow gets deeper, hunters need snowshoes. The beagles, unfortunately, can't wear snowshoes, so sometimes you have to call off your snowshoe hunting if the snow gets too deep. After Christmas, sometimes it can be just all done. All done. But the snowshoe hares have very large feet. They run on top of the snow, and they're an excellent eating rabbit. I'd say they're as good as cottontail. Bob. Well, I, the, a lot of old timers will give you some debate on that, but I have not eaten a snowshoe rabbit I didn't, or snowshoe hare that I didn't like. I think they're excellent eating, and they're they're good uh, fried, fried, it, you, baked. It, any way you cook a cottontail, cook a snowshoe is fine. But it's a it's a way of hunting where you use dogs, but instead of the grouse pheasant technique of using a pointer or the duck hunting technique of using a retriever. We're going to use beagles. Here they're hounds, and you're going, to run, you're going to run them in, hopefully, in a circle. And, and bring them right back. Yeah, right. But uh, the, the snowshoe hare hunting, I don't think, is up as much as the it's cottontail. Real, it's going to be spotty all over uh, the Upper Peninsula, where it's king up there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be spotty again in the, the northern lower. I did get some word that uh, from a biologist that uh, rabbit pop or hare populations from Cadillac to Traverse City are up considerable. But so that is some good, some good news, but it's spotty. We can forecast, make forecasts that cover the state, but uh, there are hot spots all over. Even for pheasants, there are some little tiny local pockets that have lots of pheasants. There sure are. So you have to get out and root around and find the habitat, find the spots, and you'll do pretty well. One problem with hunting season is all of this that we just went through happens at once. Oh, it sure does. In the next few weeks is when it all goes on. The migratory birds move south, move out of the state, but there is one big bright spot right now for bow hunters who are out, who started October 1st and who will be taken to the woods with guns on November 15th is our white-tailed deer population, which is at an extremely high point, a point that if we have a harsh winter, uh, and we haven't had harsh winters the past few winters. They've been some, we've had some cold winters, but 
it hasn't done in the deer like uh, all we did in the 60s and, and 70s in some of those years. 78, 79. If we do have a harsh winter, we're going to have a lot of deer dying from starvation. But right now, it's a bumper crop. The racks on the bucks are, are good because the nutrition is good for these deer. There are deer everywhere, Fred. I have never seen uh, deer all over the state like I have this year. And I think hunters in the woods will see more deer this year probably than you've ever seen in most areas. Again, there's spots that are down and there's spots that are extremely high, but it is a real bright spot for hunters in Michigan outdoors. And we have some good news for bow hunters. Those of you who, who judge your bow hunting by the moon, and I'm talking just about the phase of the moon, we had a full moon on the 28th. And during a full moon, the deer tend to be out at night more and move a little less uh, during the day. But October 13th, we're going to be down to a new moon, which means the nights are going to be uh, darker and the deer are going to tend to come out a little more in the, in the morning and the evening. Now, the Salooner Tables this weekend. We published the Salooner Tables in our Outdoor Digest, John Alden Knight's Tables, and, and these tables show that this weekend, 4.45 a.m., they should start, last for maybe two to three hours, 5.15 p.m., which puts it at dinner time, sunrise and sunset. When the Salooner Tables, which are based on the gravitational effects of the sun and the moon, the tides and so on, when they stimulate wildlife to be more active, and this coincides with morning and evening, I think that's the best hunting or fishing of all, the morning and evening, and that is coming up this weekend, so it would be a good weekend to get out for bow hunters. All over the state, the fish are hitting. They're hitting in the lakes, they're hitting in the streams. The, it's an excellent time to fish, and it's an excellent time, if you can uh, squeak away from your hunting, to take some time to get out with your fishing rod because you might end up in our trophy book. One of your best bets for catching trophy largemouth bass is in October and November, proven right here by Jerry Bell of Flint. He caught this 22-inch six-pounder last year at this time, in fact, this coming weekend, casting a spinner off Paradise Beach in Oakland County. Caught it just before dark in the evening, just as this one was caught before dark about two months ago. Dale Mitchell from DeWitt was casting a flatfish in Muskrat Lake, Clinton County, when this 21-incher smacked his lure. Largemouth lives up to its name. Look at how Dale's fist could almost disappear in those jaws. A cousin of the largemouth is a smallmouth bass. You can see its mouth is much smaller, but it fights every bit as much. In fact, some anglers swear a smallmouth is the fightinest fish going. Anthony Tannery of Detroit caught this one on a spot tail minnow in Lake St. Clair. At five and a half pounds, it stretched 22 inches long. Lake trout season closed the middle of August in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron and their tributaries, and on the next to the last day, Jay Van Steenis of Traverse City landed this 34-inch, 22-pounder on a green jig. Jay was fishing East Grand Traverse Bay at 9.30 in the morning. Betty was fishing for whitefish. That's when this huge laker picked this jig up off the bottom. And this young lady caught this lake trout on Lake Michigan on the last day of the season, August 15th. Jennifer Richardson from Northville is hoisting this nearly 19-pounder that hit a stinger trolling off Charlevoix. Another evening fish, this was caught right after dinner, 7 p.m. And finally, here's a September entry that was caught in the Grand River, Kent County. My guess is Carl Sonke from Wyoming was fishing for salmon since he was using cut spawn for bait. But he was keeping cat fishermen's hours because he caught this one at 11 p.m. It's a channel cat. It weighs over 23 pounds, 36 inches long. That's a kind of trophy that makes Carl Sonke from Wyoming our Michigan Outdoors Master Angler of the Week. Catching a trophy catfish, well, that is hard to beat. Judge James Coleman in an AM County Circuit Court ruling has ruled that the Department of Natural Resources, through the Natural Resources Commission, does not have the lawful ability to set a dove season. This has killed off any chance we might have for even a few day dove season left here in October. Also what this has done is this has moved the whole issue of a dove season to the appeals court where they're expected to make a ruling by sometime in December. For the first time in a long time, we are not going to have, those of us who want waterfall, are not going to have opening and closing times written down in the digest. It's led to mass confusion but here's what you've got to do. You've got to get a local paper and you can begin shooting a half an hour before sunrise and you can shoot till sunset. That will be a tough one to be enforced legally too out in the marsh. 
Waterfowl hunting regulations are complex. There's no doubt about it. Make sure you know what you're doing, that you have your gun plugged, the steel shot zones, honor those by steel shot and only carry steel shot in those zones. You have to have the proper stamps. Check because the hours. all the points, all or uh, many of the points are new this year too, what each bird is worth. So you got to ch double check it. Now we have a, a, a very debatable question here in DNR law enforcement. Uh, we have uh, in our Outdoor Digest, and actually we're going to take this question, it's next week's question, but it's on it's called Legal Platform. Uh, Matt McFarland from Berkeley writes, he says, were you hunting deer on TV from a portable platform? The 1984-85 hunting and trapping guide reads, you may bow hunt from a tree, portable raised platform, or portable scaffold. Hunter's name and address must be on the platform or scaffold. The key word here, Matt, is portable. This is a big question, and I answered in the digest, and I said on television last week, DNR law enforcement policies allow stands that can be removed at the end of the season, which essentially legalizes nails, screws, and spikes, because it can be argued that the platform is still portable. However, not all conservation officers agree with this. Uh, no, they don't. And in fact, uh, you know, it was my understanding, working in the legislature and trying to work on this, what was perceived to be a problem when I worked for the legislature, that you could use them so long as you pulled the stand down. Now, all of a sudden, I've been told that not true. Since 1980, there's been a DNR policy. Now, mind you, not a law, not a rule, anything legally enforceable that way, a DNR law enforcement policy which says you cannot use those. And not all officers enforce it the same way. I no. Mean, th this is I made a spot check yesterday, okay? One officer I talked to says, hey, I never write anybody for, uh, for mm -hmm. using nails as long as they have their knee or tree, or name on the tree stand and pull it down. Uh, another officer uh, writes anybody who uses a nail, so I don't so know. So we did have a call last week that several people got arrested after hearing the show, tried to put up a tree stand and got tickets. The, the upshot of the deal is, is I guess, don't use a nail. Let's try and get uh, law and uh, law division to figure out exactly what is legal and what isn't. It's unclear in the law, and as much as hunters can argue that it's portable, conservation officers are writing tickets, so to avoid the hassle, I guess, don't use nails. But this is a, a question which really ought to be cleared up. The DNR ought to get their act together and get that rule stated in plain terms. That's right. Terms you and I can understand. Okay, we got that one answered more or less for now, but let's see before we go on to our featurette, see if you can answer this question in our outdoor quiz. Auto racing, baseball, and football are among the top spectator sports in the United States. What is the number one participation sport? According to both U.S. government and A.D. Nielsen figures, fishing ranks at the top of participation sports with over 60 million anglers in America. 33% of all males and 15% of all females fish each year. Salmon fishing in October. Close to shore, anglers crowd areas such as Harrisville Harbor on Michigan's Lake Huron coastline. Now, are these folks fishing or are they snagging? An interesting question because they combine both and it's legal. It calls for wrapping a large treble hook onto your line, not tied through the eye of the hook at the end of the line, but snelled so the treble hooks lay all around the line. About two feet down at the end of your line, you put a sinker to hold the end of your line on the bottom. Now remember, the hook is up on the line, not designed to catch a fish that's feeding. But most anglers put some artificial spawn on the hooks anyway to simulate bait fishing. It's only for effect, though. Now, they cast out as far as they can from shore and let the line lay in the water. The idea is to have a salmon catch the line in its mouth. Now, at this time of year, just before spawning, salmon swim with their mouths open. This fellow right here, Ray Nestor from Akron, Ohio, just has a big open mouth king salmon run into his line right there. As the salmon swam, the line slid through its mouth until it came to the hook. Essentially, the salmon snagged itself in the mouth, and now Ray can fight it just like he would a salmon that hit the lure on purpose or picked up some spawn. Now, this technique is called tight lining. Anglers keep their lines long and tight, so their chances are better of having an open mouth salmon catch their line and consequently slide down to the hook. Now, it's not snagging fish in the body, and it satisfies the requirements of the law for fair hooking, but is it effective? Or does tight lining maybe have all the ups and downs of regular fishing? Let's watch. Oops, so get this out of his way. Oh, oh no. Yep. 
Lost him right up here? Lost him right there. Holy cow. <laughs> yep, he was a good one. Have you got any others today? Nope. That That's was, it? That was it today. Oh, what can I say? You come up here every year from Ohio. Yep. Sure do, sir. Yep. Boy, that's too bad. Yeah, it is. That was a nice one, too. A disappointment for Ray Nestor, but that's tight lining, a technique that works when the salmon are cruising and porpoising in the harbors like these salmon are doing right here. A legal manner of snagging that many bank fishermen enjoy when the salmon are in the shallow water in the fall in Michigan outdoors. Small game stew. Kathy, this looks outstanding. It is. The mushrooms in it are a little bit different than other stews. Yeah, you don't usually find those in a stew, especially a small game stew like this. You might in just a vegetable. Now, small game stew. means just about anything. Rabbit, squirrel, just pheasant, just about anything you've got. In fact, you could use tasting Combination. this. This is excellent. This tastes like, like turkey. It's <laughs> rabbit that we used. You're right. One rabbit. What do you think, Bob? Good stuff. You know, I don't very often see somebody use potatoes and, and noodles in the same stew, but I like it. It's really good. Kath, give us a rundown on how you put this together, the ingredients, because okay. this is unique it's for a stew. It's a lot of spices. Okay, we've got garlic. I'm going to just dice it here. Garlic? And I can't taste the garlic no, in here. No, you never taste anything specific. Paprika, hmm. a quarter teaspoon. Sounds Paprika. like we're going to broil a fish. Right. Okay, now we're going to make a marinade here first. This is what ah. we're doing here to make marinade to soak the what was rabbit that? in. Bacon bits? Bacon bits, right. <laughs> and Chianti. Chianti? Where do Chianti. you get Chianti? That's not a very common wine anymore. Uh, it isn't, but you can find it. We found it. <laughs> okay, here is our rabbit. All clean and ready to go. Now this rabbit was last year's rabbit. Right. Came out of the freezer. A stew right. is a good way to fix any game that's been in the freezer for quite a while. It's going to cook a long time that way. It's going to well, tenderize that it. That rabbit back looks good. I think we should have fried that up separate. <laughs> How long do you let it marinate? Okay, I marinate this overnight. Okay, now we're going to add carrots, your general stew. Mm -hmm. Carrots and potatoes and onions. We're going to layer these. This could be done in a crock pot rather than in the oven or well, that over makes a it, campfire, right? That makes it easier yet in a crock Put pot. Put it in in the morning, go to work, and when you get home at night, it smells like somebody's been cooking your supper. Pepper, allspice? Spice, right, thyme. Like I say, a lot of herbs in this one. Rosemary. But they're not strong no, herbs. No, none of them are. They're going to all blend in together. These are the types of herbs that you, you'd put on fish? Right, any one of them. Or like what is we that, have like a spaghetti sauce? Yeah. With a bay leaf? Mm. And basil, too. You find both those in spaghetti. Okay. You don't, add those, you don't add those to the ingredients? No, nope, we're going to add this so we can just whisk it out afterwards. So it, put it in you taste cloth. them, but not overly so. Yeah, they're and not a can of consomme. We need uh -huh. some liquid here. Okay, we're going to add the rabbit and all the marinade for more liquid because it's going to be cooking all day long and it's just going to kind of disappear. That is an unusual batch of ingredients. It is, yep. But I'm glad to see that there aren't things in there that just totally take away and overpower. No, they don't. Like you say, you taste them, but they're not real strong. And you, mushrooms? Mushrooms at the very end, last half hour. And this is at the small game stew. This, I'm going to show you a shot here of, of what this meat looks like. And this is rabbit, and it looks like I'd say turkey. It does. And Cooking it, that way, it's not all dried out. It tastes out. like turkey, which you could use turkey, I bet, in this recipe. Or chicken. Mm -hmm. A good way to make a chicken go a mm. long ways. I don't know. I like rabbit in it. This, <laughs> is, this tastes awfully good. But it's amazing how much rabbit or squirrel, when prepared like this, properly taken care of and cleaned up, tastes like, uh, if anybody asked what it tastes like, I'd say turkey. Right. Mm. This is good. A simple recipe. You know, it's a snowshoe rat or snowshoe hare, too. This is the snowshoe that we got Excellent last year. Name. Next week on Michigan Outdoors, we tackle the subject of handgun hunting, a very misunderstood aspect of the outdoors. We'll go through the steps it takes to purchase, keep, and carry a handgun for target and hunting in Michigan, a process that might surprise you how to practice, how to shoot, and Bob Garner will bring you up to date on the Southern Michigan Handgun Hunting Bill, hopefully with some good news. Our recipe is an hors d'oeuvre made with salmon. You're not going to want to miss this one. It's a great little recipe for the coming holidays. All this and a lot more coming up at this same time next week right here on PBS.